Hey, Monica, did you know it's now even easier to listen to Round the Hay Bale podcast? What? Really? How easy? That's right. All you have to do is say, Alexa, play Round the Hay Bale podcast. Playing Round the Hay Bale podcast on Apple Music. Ooh, we fancy. Tune in to Round the Hay Bale every Monday at 9 a.m. Central. Round the Hay Bale is brought to you by... With gardening season in full bloom, Kelzyme certified organic products are just what your garden needs. From fertilizing your orchards to feeding your soil, Kelzyme's calcium-based fertilizer gives your plants the essential minerals they need to thrive. Applying Kelzyme to agricultural soils and waters has been proven to increase plant and crop yields while making vegetables and grains healthier and more nutritious. In addition, Kelzyme can help restore the nutrient balance in animals when they're fed plants grown using Kelzyme in both soil and water. To check out all of Kelzyme's organic products, visit Kelzyme.com and use our promo code HEYBALE for 10% off of your purchase. Grab a cup of joe and gather round the hay bale with your hosts, Alicia from Country Mama Musings, JC from Ormsby Farms, Lisa from Yogi Hollow Farm, and Monica from Bland's Promised Land Ranch. Now, here they are. Hey, y'all. Hey. Hey, y'all. Hey, welcome back to Round the Hay Bale, Season 4. I'm Alicia. What's up, y'all? It's Casey. Hey, y'all. It's Lisa. And I'm Monica. Welcome back to another episode and a new season of Round the Hay Bale. So on this episode, we are going to be discussing frugal farming and what frugal farming looks like to one person and one family and one homestead may be completely different to another. So we are wanting to share what we consider frugal farming and what we consider uh, living a frugal life on the homestead. And so uh, let's start it off and see, uh, Lisa, do you have any ideas of what does frugal farming mean to you? Oh, you know, I have a lot of ideas. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, um, I've got this huge list in front of me, you know, just to make sure that I don't forget any good talking points, but please stop me if I go on too long here. Um, so, you know, for me, it's all about what can I turn this, this item into, you know? So I think first of all, it's making sure that you can obtain things, whether you're obtaining things from auctions, yard sales, they call them yard sales, garage sales, tag sales, whatever they call them. You go to somebody's house, you buy some good stuff. Um, looking at free stuff on Marketplace and Craigslist, those are some really great places to go. One of the things that we like to do is peruse Marketplace and Craigslist for our hog panel and cattle panel. We do that on a regular basis. Why? We don't necessarily need them now, but we're going to need them soon. And with the price of steel, things have gone up. Uh, I think those panels used to be uh, $24, and now I think they're in the 30s, if I'm not mistaken, or at least that's what they are here. I have to admit, it's been a long time since I purchased any new hog or cattle panels. Uh, the difference between hog or cattle press. panels? Really? $42. Wow. Mm -hmm. Holy guacamole. Well, you know, a lot of people ask, like, what's the difference between hog panel and cattle panel? Well, cattle panel is usually taller, hog panel is shorter, and it usually has, at the bottom, it has, I'm holding my fingers like people can see me. Um, but at the bottom, it is not evenly spaced. It is more narrow in spacing, and then it graduates to wider spacing up near the top. So I give that to you because if you're looking online at free panel, that's really important to have. Um, I think the other thing is, is we peruse it on a regular basis just to make sure that we have an inventory of it. So right now we probably have about 10 panels in the backyard in a pile that are against the tree for whenever we need them. So if we need them for a garden, if we need them to replace panel in pastures, super important. And I think that's one of the best ways 
to really get ahead of things is looking for things all the time, not just when you need it. Because when you need it, you're not going to find it, right? Unless you go to the store. So looking ahead of time and saying, what can I do with these items? Um, and I think the other thing for me is, you know, before we were on the podcast, we were talking about, you know, we obtained a piece of a conveyor belt. Uh, and last year we made a building for our meat birds and turkeys. Now the turkeys never went in, but the meat chickens did go in at night. And one of the things that we did was we decided meat birds make a lot of um, manure and they smell. And so a conveyor belt went in at the bottom on the bottom floor, which was a pallet of the house and allowed us to pull that out and hose it off so it didn't stink so bad. So it was really good. So That's awesome. That yeah. is so cool. Because think about how much smell they put off and all that urine's bad for them. So for you to be able to do that, that's really good. Yeah. Not, now I know why people put their meat birds in tractors and move them around a lot. I don't have that luxury because I need the grass for my pigs and I don't have a lot of flat land for a tractor. So there'd be a lot of modifications. How, how about you, Monica? Well, I think, I mean, I'm with you with the whole, like, shop around, too, and, like, look for things. So, you know, I was telling you guys earlier, too, my, my father-in-law is pretty awesome way about that. See, I'm not in that mindset. I'm more of the mindset of if I see it, I might need it, so I'll take it. I don't always know ahead of time what I'm going to use, but my, my father-in-law is very much in the, I know that I'm going to need X, Y, and Z, and now I'm going to go see where I can find it. And so, um, you know, he was able to acquire some free um like that PVC clear glass. It's not glass. It's PVC. I don't know what it is. What is it? That clear stuff. What's that called, guys? The plexiglass. Like there you go. Plex yeah, like a plexiglass. There you go. <laughs> plexiglass. So he was able to acquire some free plexiglass from a store that was getting rid of it thanks to COVID not being around anymore. Thank you, 2020. Um, so he was able to acquire some free plexiglass. And when he did, we were able to use that as a refill or a redo of our um, four-wheeler. We have a, a four by four wheeler UTV, whatever you want to call it, that the windshield broke out of and back in 2018 and it was cracked and it's completely gone. So it's been gone for a while. So the kids have been eating bugs for years and now we have new plexiglass to cover your face when you're out there driving through the pasture. And it's been huge, huge help, um, especially on those cold days that take some of that wind off your face because, you know, not having that for a few years, but it was really cool to see him go out and acquire the things that we needed and he's really good at that. Like when we need something, if he can't fix it, he will go find it. And I think that's one way to be super frugal is to go out there and finding what you're needing and knowing what you're kind of going to need in the back of your mind. It took a year, a couple years for him to really find that. But it came in handy when he did. So it's kind of cool that way. What about you guys, Casey, Alicia? Well, I know when we moved onto this property, there was just junk everywhere and of course being new homeowners coming into taking over this five acres we were quick to want to get rid of stuff and one of the things that my husband was constantly obsessing about was oh my gosh the farmer before us had so much wire there's wire everywhere and he couldn't get, he could not wait to get rid of the wire so and it was getting you know we had equipment that we were using and all of a sudden there would be wire all wrapped around the wheel of whatever farm implement you're using because there's wire that was under a pile of dirt that you didn't know was there. And so it was very frustrating for him because there's just wire everywhere and feed bags everywhere. And so he got rid of a lot of wire. And now, nine years later, he's like, oh, man, I need wire. And we don't have it because he got rid of it. So, you know, for frugal farming for us, what we've learned uh, the nine years that we've lived here is you have to look at something and see how you can look at it in 10 different ways to see if it is going to pay off to keep it. And so I know that, like I said, when we first moved here, the man had feed bags everywhere and we got rid of a lot of the feed bags. Now I realize those feed bags have so many different purposes. And it was, wasn't making sense that you know, when we had a cleanup day or something to do or even something around the house, you know, you get a big old black plastic trash bag out. Why? Why not just go get one of the feed bags from the chicken feed 
fill that up. It's stronger, it holds just as much, and it does just as well, and I didn't have to pay for it. So same with the string, that when you take the string top off of the feed bags, there's always something I can use it for. Um, one thing I was really going to hit on as far as our frugal farming is for those who are listening that have gardens, don't throw away your milk jugs. Rinse out your milk jugs. Store the caps separate so you're not putting them on and you have any bacterial buildup, you know, because you rinse them, but you don't always get it all. Save those for little terrariums and for planting your seedlings. If you're going to have a frost, you can take those milk jugs, cut the bottoms off of them, put them upside down over your seedlings to protect them from frost. There's so many different things you can do. I had a lot of those gallon jugs set aside, and I was planning on using them for, uh, for the garden solely for the garden and my neighbor said I've just harvested tons and tons and tons and bushels and bushels of apples and I'm making cider bring your own jugs and come press cider with us you can take some cider home boom had the jugs I didn't have to worry about where I was going to get them from I didn't have to take her jugs and I had the opportunity to go actually press my own cider and bring it home all in exchange for giving her some of those jugs which to everybody else is trash I came home with cider, and you all know how much cider is a gallon. So my trash paid off really well for our farm here. So those are some of the things I think of when I think of the frugal farming. And I know that, you know, some of us junior homesteaders here, when we get our, our properties, that's the first thing we want to do, throw everything away. And some of us have had to tell Casey, Casey, don't throw that stuff away. I was about to say, are we calling it. me out? In a very kind and loving way. Yeah. But yeah, now you're true, learning. Your second year on, you're starting to find different purposes mm -hmm. for everything but yep. the Maalox bottles. Yeah, the, the Maalox. Yes, those the are Maalox gone. or my, whatever, my Lanta. Yeah. Oh, well, my Lanta. Get rid of those masks. Oh, my Lanta. You know, I, I wanted to play off of what Alicia said about the milk jugs. Um, I did winter sowing this year. Now, mind you, I was not impressed um, with that method. Um, I was impressed with the fact that some things germinated because they were out there in below zero weather, but I just overall wasn't impressed with the method. But I had been saving distilled water jugs because we have them here for a CPAP, and unfortunately it generates a lot of waste. And so what I wanted to share is the fact that when we had hail, my, my new cucumber seedlings I just put out got pummeled, and one of the things that I did was exactly what Alicia said, was cut the top off the milk jugs. And actually, I still have them on those seedlings to help create a little mini greenhouse around them uh, mm -hmm. to help them really boost and get moving. It's well, it's brilliant. great, too, if you happen to plant where you have predators, if you have, you know, plant predators, if you have squirrels or if you have rabbits. You could, you could put those over your plants and it provides that extra bit of attention for somebody coming into your garden and eating all of the leaves off of your plants. There are a lot of different uses for something so simple. It, you know, even if it is the, uh, the half gallons, whether they're plastic or even the cardboard, you can use those. You know, Lisa, Lisa is really into the cracky growing method. You could use those half gallon cardboard either milk or juice containers that have the little twist-off cap on the side, you can actually use those for Cracky. And it's just you just have to think outside the box. And for those of you who don't know what Cracky is, Lisa has some great videos over on her channel. It's just a different method of growing your vegetables, and it's very, very uh, successful. Lisa's had great success with it. And so I have followed yes. in her footsteps. And I've noticed those are some things you can use. You can use those containers for growing plants in. It's amazing. I will say you know, that my I'm... My sister-in-law lives in Maryland. Sorry, go ahead, Casey. No, I was just going to toot Lisa's horn also because I have to go back and re-watch her cracky videos because that seems to be the only thing that's going to grow my lettuce that I need for a year's supply of lettuce. I have tried everything else. I have literally tried everything under the sun. And finally, I have gotten smart enough to be like, okay, I'm going to take Alicia and Lisa's word for it, and I'm going to try this and use the 4 billion quart jars that the lady that sold me the homestead left um, and have me some indoor garden stuff. But I'm slowly learning to save some of this stuff. Y'all know when we first started this podcast four seasons ago, 
I would complain about all these tomato cages that this woman left. And I am not a fan of tomato cages, not at all. And I, I'm, I'm the bougie homesteader. Okay. We're talking about frugal farming. I'm the, the bougie homesteader. And I bought the hog panels to trellis my tomatoes, but they were too short. So thank goodness I did not get rid of the tomato cages because 40 of my tomato plants needed tomato cages and I was able to go dig it out of my little trash area. Hello. Let me, let me tell you a little something about tomato cages because this came up yesterday. So, you know, again, I really try to do frugal farming, but you know those tomato steaks that are green plastic coated steel? Do you know how much those are now? Five ninety nine a piece. But, but here's the deal. We use them a ton in the garden. We use them a ton around the property. I paid five ninety nine dollars a piece. $89 worth of these poles I bought yesterday. Why? Because I wanted to trellis my tomatoes using a string, cotton string, right? I bought, spent $89 on those stupid poles. Don't worry, I'll still use them for something here. However, in my one greenhouse, I have raised beds, worked beautifully. In my other greenhouse, all I have is containers because it's mobile. And we're afraid of having all that weight. So I put those up there and just the layout of the pots made it impossible to string it the right way, if that makes sense. So I had to go down to the garage and get the tomato cages that my neighbor gave me, and I had, would have never had to spend that money on those poles, but I needed tomato cages because I can't fit a panel in there, and I need something because, quite honestly, two of them started to bend over in the four days I was gone <laughs> because it's so hot in there, they have grown exponentially. So e even though I despise tomato cages, and you do, Casey, they do come in handy. And I'm talking mine are so old because our neighbor had them and he just keeps passing them on to us. But sometimes you have to have them. Right. And, you know, and, I saw something really cute also with the tomato cages, like uh, lighting, like uh, stringing lights through them on top of like a lean-to to kind of give it like a rustic, you know, I'm always looking for the bougie farmhouse decor. So I was like, hey, if I have to keep all 4 billion of these tomato cages, I'll string it with some lights. <laughs> it's funny that you said that, Casey, because that's just going to say, you can hit the yard sales after the holidays and get all of the garland, wrap garland around it. They look like little Christmas trees, put lights on them. But what I was going to say is, Lisa just spent $89 on something she couldn't use this time. And... If something like that happens to you, don't look at that as something that has defeated your purpose. Like Lisa said, she's put them aside and she knows, without a doubt, there will be something that she can use those for later. So they may not have paid off today, but they're going to pay off and then some in the days ahead or the weeks or the months or the years ahead because she'll have them on hand. Who knows how much those tomato steaks are going to cost two, three, four years from now. So she's ahead of the game in a sense because she realizes that even though she couldn't use them for what she had in mind, they're going to be able to be used in the future for another project on her farm. And having the ability to look forward and see that and recognize it, that is part of frugal farming. Absolutely. I mean, I, I could have wiped them off and brought them back. My, my hardware store would have taken them back. I'm not taking them back because, like I said, we do square foot gardening so imagine, if you will, in each square foot, we put one squash and we put them right next to each other. And our plan is to use them vertically. So they won't go bad at all, like Alicia said. We will use them. Um, you know, and, and sometimes, I, as much as I am a strong proponent of frugal farming, there comes a time that you need to invest in your farm or your homestead or whatever you want to call it you have to invest in things. Um, and so, for example, you know, you don't want to spend money. We didn't buy a brand new tractor. We are too small to be offered a beautiful sponsorship by Kubota. So 
we went and bought a tractor at an affordable price that we could work on um, at an auction. And it's already helped because when we had to get rid of the old strawberry bed, did we have to shovel it up? No. Ryan scraped it up, took all of the compost that was in that area and dumped it on our compost pile so that way we could use it. Whereas, you know, otherwise we'd be we'd killing ourselves. But sometimes you do have to invest in your homestead. And so the $89 goes right back into the homestead. Can I just say if Kubota is listening, all four of us are growing channels and we could all use a Kubota. I'm just saying. Well, just I was saying. Gonna, yeah, just saying. Oh, well, I was going to jump on that too and say, you know, you're exactly right. When it comes to frugal, you can be frugal, but you can still spend money and you're going to have to because the thing is, is that the money that you spent on that tractor, Lisa, is going to pay you back because remember, our time that we spend doing work is also valuable. And and I think what most people don't do, and I think it's really unfortunate, is that we as farmers, homesteaders, people that just work at your house, you don't put value, enough value on your time. You know, that's one thing that Eric says to me all the time, is that our time is basically money and the money that he makes at work so he comes home from work and then he's still after working a full-time job driving extra hours he makes a living because of that we we live off of the his, his paycheck and that's amazing but then now we've got to put extra time into the farm and that time that we're spending doing certain tasks is very valuable so by having a tractor by spending several thousands of dollars on a tractor we are now taking that time that we had to hand shovel and hand move, for instance, compost from one area of our pasture to our garden bed, he can do it in 30 minutes versus it would have taken all of us, even our team of children, it would have taken us hours to do. That is valuable time that we could have spent doing other things. And so you have to put that investment in. You know, another thing that we do is we look at what the payback is on whether it's tools or whether it's animals. In order for you to get beef for your family to eat, you have to invest in a cow, in a cattle, right? So for us, we go purchase we purchase the original cattle. Now we've got the cost of the cattle. We've got the cost of the hay that we're feeding them. And we've got the cost of making sure that they're cared for properly in their first few days that they're here. And then as they get older, we're waiting. That time for turnaround for large animals like that, you've got an 18-month window before you can even start getting that cow pregnant, right? So then now the cow's pregnant. You've got yourself a bull or you've rented one, and I've got more money that I'm pouring into her. So just purchasing a cow for, for beef or cattle, let's just say cattle because I'm going to be particular here. I'm going to buy cattle for beef. My cow puts down a steer, or puts down a little bull calf. We steer him up. And by the time we can actually take him to process, we've now had four years under our belt. I mean, the first three or four years of our ranch, of our life here, we didn't produce our own beef because you have that time you've poured into it. Now, the setup, the initial cost, the purchasing of the tractor, the, the purchasing of the animal, all the original costs now are coming to fruition. And now you're being able to see that frugal farming come to pass. You're seeing the initial investment pay you back. Because now I can simply tell you that I have never, I have not gone to the grocery store to buy my own beef in years. But beyond that, I still have to pay for processing. Well, how do I do that? Here's where my frugal nature comes in. I don't want to pay for processing my cows. I've already paid for hay and hay is not cheap. So, and because we have short winters, we're very blessed with short winters. So the hay time is very short compared to most. Um, but on, on really dry years, we pay a lot more for hay. Last year was a terrible year for hay and it was very expensive. Men, farmers everywhere were selling their herds just by the dozens. It was crazy the amount of people that had to sell the herd last year. So here's my payback. I take my cattle in and then I sell half of a cow to pay for the other half that I keep. Or I take in two cows and steers usually. I take in two steers. I process one for just me and then I sell the entire other one so that that money that I've that I've now spent on processing is completely covered by the cost of how much people have paid me back for what they're buying, if that makes sense. So I don't want to spend money 
any more money on this beef that I have to. I do the same thing with the pork. I do the same thing with most animals that we process here. The initial investment is there. And sometimes you really do have to make that investment. And um, in the end, the payback is what really makes it frugal in that sense. Casey. Monica, so well said, like beyond well said. And it's the same thing, thinking that same mentality for veggies. Because when you start a garden, you have to put money into fertilizer. Um, If you do ground cover, you're buying that ground cover. You're buying how it's going to trellis, like me and Lisa were both talking about for different types of plants. You're talking about uh, water hoses. Are you doing an irrigation system? Um, Are you buying cans so you can can it? But over the first two years, you slowly start to see the money go back to, I bought the canning stuff, or I bought uh, the $200 ground cover. Um, That is one thing I think I learned from you, Monica, you and Eric, is everything on my homestead is on payroll. And it has to pay me back somehow, or it's got to go. You're going to be in the unemployment line. And just like I was saying to you, Monica, my peach trees are on the verge of unemployment line because they're not producing. I'm putting too much money into it to get, I can't even sell peaches. So now that's how that's how the frugal farming works. So well said. It takes a while, y'all. Don't think that it's going to happen overnight that you're going to start making the money back on your homestead. You have to put the money out there. I think the business world says, what, five years before you start making a uh, a payback for your stuff. But Lisa, what about you? What do you think about that? Well, I was going to say, you know, you both said it really beautifully. You both said it so beautifully about, you know, having it pay you back. Now we're not a hundred percent to the point where we're getting paid back, but there are a few areas that we've done really well in. And so our chickens pay for themselves, except for our time our chickens pay for themselves, right? They pay for their feed, all of that stuff. We've just doubled our flock. Uh, We're actually adding five more in July that come with our meat birds. We'll have almost 50 birds. And they're paying for themselves because we rarely have eggs for ourselves with 50 birds, almost 50 birds, right? And so the chickens are all set. Our turkeys this year, we sold all of the turkey babies that hatched. So that was 13 birds. And that pays for turkey feed for the year because turkeys don't eat as much as chickens. Uh, So it doesn't pay for their bedding, but it pays for their feed. Great, sounds good. We chose not to raise meat turkeys this year because we wanted to sell instead because we still have plenty of turkey in the freezer. And we said, well, we'll wait till next year. And so with the piglets, so now with Cooney Cooney pigs, that's a real hard one, right? Because you look at commercial sows, you know, end of January to October or even August, you're good to go with a commercial sow. Cooney Coonies, we're talking 12 to 18 months before you get a payback. But selling the piglets and the prices will be going up this year. Selling the piglets has helped me pay for all the winter hay last year because unlike Monica, We feed hay most of the year because we have small land. If we're lucky, we'll get two months without hay. Um, And that's alfalfa. We're feeding horse grade alfalfa to our our pigs because we have to make sure we don't have any poisonous weeds in it. Um, And so you have to have that infrastructure where you're setting it up to at least sustain what you have, if not make money on it. Um, And I think... I think that's really important. And one of the things that we've been looking at moving forward is, okay, we're going to raise a bunch of pheasants one year, but we're not going to raise them the next year. You know, it's sort of like Monica with her green beans. And when you talked about the garden, Casey, one thing I wanted to say is I could not agree with you more. If we have not invested in even garden cloth until this year, why? Because the garden was not giving me anything. And it was a waste of my money to invest in that garden. So instead, we focused on soil, amending the soil, getting manure, all of that kind of thing. And 
it's funny because we had no problem spending about a hundred bucks on lumber for the new greenhouse because that greenhouse will give us something it may be a rough year with it because it's new and we have to learn it but it's going to give us something and right now it's already given us more than my garden has given us and we didn't harvest anything yet it's just that my plants are growing at a much quicker rate in there with the heat so i couldn't agree more i'm not going to invest in solar you know sun cloths that are uh, i'm sorry ground cover that is uv resistant and all that i bought i used leftover cheap garbage cloth to see how it went this year and so far it seems okay but i'm not convinced until we get to dry august then i'll let you know <laughs> You know, I think there's another aspect of, of being frugal that all of you in some way have touched on, and but the word hasn't been said. And, you know, you can be really frugal with your, your harvests if you learn to barter, if you can correctly learn to barter. You can take something you have on your farm and barter it with another farmer down the road or somebody who's looking for something on those social media outlets. You can barter for something. You don't have to sell it for money because... People aren't going to want to pay what you may know it's worth, say, for the steel value of something. If somebody needed some tomato poles, like what Lisa has, and she didn't want to take them back to the $5.99 to the hardware store because she knows she can use them later, she may really be in need of something. Let's say her tractor down the road blows a hydraulic line, and the hydraulic line is $89.00. She might know a farmer that has some spare, really quality hydraulic lines, but he needs six or seven tomato poles. There's ways to barter. There's ways that you can put your eggs out or your produce out, and you can barter with your neighbors. And I've been doing that. I don't have, uh, I don't have a cherry tree, but I have eggs. And so my neighbor needs eggs, and she comes and lets me pick all the cherries I want off of her cherry tree. So now I have cherries in the freezer for something to do later on down the road. So it's just, you know, and, and I had too many eggs. I wasn't going to use them all anyways. I would have given her the eggs, but the bonus is, is now I have cherries. So you have to have that open line of communication and the way of thinking about what do I have that you want? What do you have that I want? And let's make a trade. And I think that really plays into the homesteading community as, as a great way of being frugal. And I think that goes back to the community sufficiency right relying on community in that bartering aspect versus self-sufficiency for me is because the reality of it is is i'm not going to have a cow um i'm not going to have a dairy cow I, I don't need a dairy cow but i want one but you know i mean i i could could i raise a steer yeah i could i could fence in an area i could raise a steer it would be a lot of work to keep a place clean because it wouldn't have enough room. It wouldn't be fair to the animal, in my opinion. I could feed hay. I could do all that. I could grain feed. But I'm not going to do that because it's, it's not appropriate for the animal. But so instead, I rely on a local rancher to get my beef from instead. And we are now one of the first ones because we buy regularly. We are the first ones who get called before he gets any new customers. And Wait. that's important, Alicia, or Lisa, to say that is the the knowing that your homestead can't handle a certain animal, and being responsible enough as a homesteader to say, "Hey, you know, I would really like to have a, you know a dairy cow and a baby. Um, should I? No, but I can help support." this homestead and their frugal farming and their self-sustainability by purchasing from them or bartering as alicia was saying we do that we when we joined our local farmers market we've met so many amazing farmers that that's all they, they don't want you to come buy their produce they want to barter like if i don't have onions I, i'm not going to call the lady's name out but she's like no, no 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 don't give me your money how about i get one of your cookie cakes or i'll get one of your bags of bagels and we'll call it even whatever the, it is a beautiful thing and that is a very important part of frugal farming because that saves you money and the time of having to grow up a calf or a steer um so i agree with that 
Lisa, I'm right with you. I want one, but I ain't ever have one on this homestead. It's my homestead's too small um, to to put a mom yeah. and a baby on it. Well, the funniest thing is like we we've not had a lot of luck with bartering here. We've not, and I don't know if it's because we are um, not born and raised here. However, um, we the trailer that the mobile greenhouse is on was a trade uh, for what happened was when we decided not to burn wood anymore for various reasons, we had already cut several cords of wood. And so we told somebody, uh, come get, you know, the cords of wood, it's yours. And they said, well, you're buying the trailer from us. Let's just swap. Deal. So that's how we got it. Um, but normally bartering is more of a struggle for us here, one way or another. Mm. Um, however, with people that we are close to, like I have some fellow South Dakotan uh, Insta friends who are not far from me, um, we've either done cash deals or we've bartered. But th that ended up being a really good deal because we got that trailer and it saved us because that was how we brought our meat pigs to the processor with little, little effort put in. You know, one thing I also wanted to hit on, you know, for, for our listeners who maybe don't have an acreage or a property, you know, it's something that we discussed in one of our earlier episodes. T take a look at how you can be frugal, even if you are purchasing something from the grocery store that you're bringing back to your homestead. And where I'm going with this is, we discussed before about getting certain plants that are prolific that you can reuse over and over again. And I keep coming back to this because I think it's so important and I wish people would would embrace this because I see it all the time. You can go to your local grocery store, and maybe not all of them, but the majority of them, and in the produce department, there's going to be a small little plastic container of basil for $3.99. But right across the aisleway is a live basil plant for $2.50, and you can use your EBT card on that if you happen to have EBT. Even if you don't have EBT and you're using cash, you're still getting a better deal buying the fresh basil that you can then grow in your windowsill. You can take clippings from it and start new plants. And before you know it, you've got enough basil that you can then harvest it and freeze it. I take mine and I chop it up and I freeze it with olive oil. I freeze it with olive oil and parmesan for almost like a pesto. I freeze it in butter and that way I can use it for any type of baking that I want to do. You've got all of this basil where before you were going to spend $3.99 on four or five little leaves. And that's where you've got to start thinking about how to be frugal as well. Find the things that you can start having work for you. Like everybody has said, it's on the payroll. You've got to make it work. Don't let it just be dead end money. Find something, some way to think about something so that you can make it work and come back in a return for you. I, I agree. I mean, I think that that's one of the things, that's one of the rules we have in our garden is our garden is very basic. It is not bougie. It is not fancy. It is the whole past four years of researching what grows well in this zone and what doesn't. And so, you know, when we remove, when we put everything into the greenhouses, so we've got tomatoes, we've got peppers, uh, we've got some bush cucumbers, I've got some other stuff in containers outside the garden. So the garden itself only has potatoes, some bush beans, and some squash and our last chance for cucumbers and cauliflower or they're not coming back um, but it has to be things that work for us so if zucchini and squash grow well for us we've doubled the amount of zucchini and squash that we are growing why because we know it's going to grow whereas with other items i'm not going to waste my time i'm not going to grow fancy fancy i'm not going to do that because it is a waste of my time and money to grow and it has to pay me back And, and what's really neat, too, is let's say that your zucchini are successful this year, and I do pray that they are. There are so many different ways that you can can and put up your zucchini. You can make, uh, what is it called, pineapple, where it's you're doing pretend pineapple out of zucchini and zapple pie filling, which is pretend 
pie filling that you can make with your zucchini. There are all these different things that you can do with that harvest. But in addition, if you get something that's extra like I do with cucumbers, it's funny because Lisa and I are on the same parallel. Uh, we're almost directly across from each other, but we're just in, in different... Uh, she's more mountainous, I'm more plains, and my cucumbers do great. But you know what? When I get too many of them and I just can't make any more pickles, I feed them to my chickens. There's different ways that you can make those crops work for you. So if Lisa has an abundance of zucchini and she can't can it all and she can't barter it or put it into breads and sell it, whatever, you know, she can throw a few to her turkeys and her chickens and it's just a little added treat for them. And you're not having to go out and buy just that much amount of feed. It, it's, it works for you. There's so many different ways of looking how to make a crop work for you. So, you know, one of the things that we talk about with it, going right off of what you said, Alicia, you know, if you have an abundance of something, that may be the very thing that there's someone else that doesn't have at all. And so, um, you know, I have a friend that has an abundance. She always has an abundance of chickens, of ducks, of all kinds of poultry and she always has an abundance of eggs and so I know that I grow a garden and she necessarily doesn't and so one of the things that I've been doing over the years is when my garden starts coming in immediately I'm like hey girl I've got this going on you know are you interested and I know that I can give her the extras out of my garden. I know that I can trade with her for certain things. If I'm looking for a specific duck breed that I know she has I can trade her. Recently my um sister-in-law's sister, so family in Maryland, um, you know, was looking for um, some hatching eggs. And we knew that um, we could help provide that for her um, because some things fell through in her order that she made. And so we knew we could help her. And so I simply traded with a friend of mine. My friend's like, well, what you got? And I said, well, I need this. And she said, well, I have, I said, I have this, if you have this. So we just traded back and forth and I was able to give her some, you know, cow liver that she absolutely loves that I don't even sell anyway. I just gave to her and we traded up for eggs. She knows that I'm looking for a new sow soon. And there was a gentleman that was looking for goose eggs. Well, I don't sell goose eggs, but I know a friend who does. So I reached out to my friend and said, hey, do you have goose eggs for sale? And she said, sure, but you know, I don't know. You can just have them for free. And I was like, I don't want them. There's like, a guy that I'm talking to that's going to have a sow that I really want this summer. And she's like, well, how much is the sow? So I was able to tell her, okay, well, I'm looking at about $200, maybe $300 for this pig. She said, okay, I got you. So she gets in touch with the guy and she says, well, I'm Monica's friend and I'm going to sell you some goose eggs, but I'm not going to sell them. I'm going to barter. I'm going to give you these goose eggs and I'm going to give you all these eggs that you're asking for. And you're going to give that sow to my friend when she's ready to be born. And so basically, just from making friends, from being a part of a community that's bigger than myself, I'm now able to get a sow for free because I know a friend who knows a friend and we were able to make friends. And so I, that being said, making sure that when you do this homesteading life, and I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again and again, you have to make sure you remember you can't just do it all yourself. And you know, we talk about that. And Lisa was saying something earlier about self-sufficiency being more of a community sufficiency. And it's so extremely true. You cannot do all these things by yourself. You can try. And without the right people sometimes in place, you're going to watch yourself fail and it's going to be a hard pill to swallow because then when you're by yourself, who's going to lift you up? So make those friends, make those connections, not only just for the bartering part of it, for the learning part of it and for the encouragement part of it. So working together within a community is one of the best ways to be frugal, to be resourceful and to save time and money because your time is valuable in all of that. And I just want to add to that because you're, you're absolutely right. You save a ton of money uh, by using your resources and getting connected to people, to people. I just recently went to visit my pig mentors who generously have spent countless hours over the years since I've, before I got Sherman, I have been talking to them and cumulatively the hours are you wouldn't believe how much time we've spent talking about pigs and how much wisdom experience knowledge they have given to me um literally on the phone with me while eleanor was farrowing and super helpful information and when you look at the limited resources that are here for cooney cooney pigs 
but you look at the connections that are made. For example, I'm connected to my breeder who is super, super helpful. Um, I'm connected to my mentors in Texas. I recently had a localish uh, farm reach out to me and see if I could take a boar, um, a registered boar for free. Um, I really wanted this boar bad, um, but unfortunately I decided that I already have two and so I needed to wait. Now wasn't the time to do it. Then I found out it was Sherman's brother and I wanted it even more, but I passed, you know, it goes back to responsibility, right? Cause it's another mouth to feed and I already have two boars fighting in a pasture. We don't need to add a dynamic that could be an issue. So it's just, you, you get opportunities that come up to you that would not be there because you're connected in the community. And so that is a super important way to do it because what happens is with that boar, for example, that person reached out directly to me. Who else then reached out to me? My breeder, because it came from her. And she said, hey, this is Sherman's brother. This guy's looking for a new home. I reached out to people and said, hey, even down to Texas, I said, hey, this guy's got a boar. He needs to rehome it because he's got too many boars. And so you have that connection where everybody is supporting everybody. And I get texts like that all the time. Hey, you want a sow? Hey, you want this? Somebody's fallen on hard times and needs to rehome them. So it can be, to me, that's where the community sufficiency is so important. But you bring up an important point, Lisa, because... With frugality on your farm comes responsibility. Because here you have this great opportunity, but you've learned a lot enough and you know enough now that you did what was responsible. It wasn't what your heart wanted, but you did what was responsible, not just for you, but for your animals there and for this other boar. And it was, in essence, a frugal decision on many different levels, not just monetarily. It was the decision that had to be made. And so with that frugality comes responsibility. And I think that's a really great point for, for all of us. Monica? Sorry, this daggone mute button. Man. Um, okay, so, you know, you're we talking about getting to know people and stuff, and it made me think really fast, too, because, you know, Lisa, you've got these beautiful, wonderful mentors. You've been talking to them for years, and you're talking about putting time into it, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. We... We try to, as homesteaders, we try to learn and we try to absorb as much information as possible. And so then we always just try to offer it up to everybody else because we don't want people to make the same mistakes we've done. It's just one of those things, right? But think of how many people as new homesteaders pay hundreds of dollars to go to these big conferences that charge them hundreds of dollars. So one of the best, most the easiest ways to save yourself money as a homesteader is to just make connections in your small community so that they can put you in touch with the bigger people and make the bigger community connections. Because here's the thing, not everybody is going to be Doug and Stacy. I'm just saying it. But, but you know how many people are out there that are very knowledgeable, like those bigger YouTubers or bigger podcasters you say. And I'm telling you right now, I think they're great. I, I think they're awesome. I, I just recently subscribed to their YouTube channel. Literally, I just did like three weeks ago. But but here's what I want to say. You can see people and think, man, they're amazing. I want to be like them. I want to emulate them. But in the grand scheme of things, there are lots more people that have the information that they have that are more reachable, if you, if you understand. Because I'm going to tell you right now that I can reach out to Lisa for a multitude of information. I can reach out to Casey and be like, hey, I need help with this. I could ask Alicia all kinds of stuff that I know that my friends are valuable in those ways. And so just by making those connections that you might think are small connections, it's going to lead you on to bigger things and it's going to save you money instead of going to these big conferences. Now, I'm not saying don't go to the big conferences. Go for it if that's what you want to do. But let me tell you, let me tell you, it is so worth meeting the people that you might think are small people because those people have knowledge that you could not even imagine. So save your money. Talk to people. True. And, and, True. and to follow up on that, Lisa, um, Monica, 
we we have this connection. We've all done it. We've all contacted each other. And what's really great is when you are working with a group of people that have developed that relationship, there's no um, there's no upstaging. There's no you know attitude. Because I've recently had one of my co-hosts reach out to me and say, hey, how do I do this? And instead of me pretending like I know what I'm talking about, I said, you know what, I haven't done that. Maybe try this other friend. So there's 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 no attitude. There's no um, upstaging, like I said, of each other. We're here to help each other and we'll get you to that person. And I know that they were successful in what they were attempting to do because they were able to get the information from somebody who had been there. I hadn't done it yet. Oh, wait, but we're talking about me again, right? <laughs> okay, sure. Yeah, I but I didn't, it, yes. I didn't know either, though, Alicia. Sure. Neither one of us knew. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. We figured yes, it out. So, okay. It so, question. Well, for but viewers I I listening. One of these guys and they'll have the answer. So for the viewers that are listening, it was me. I had a canning question. So I'm thinking, I'm like, okay, Lisa's going to laugh in my face if I ask her. <laughs> so I'm not going to ask her about canning baked beans. I let, do you can I baked beans? I would not. No, you would tell her that I, you're... I never you have that, enough to can. Oh. <laughs> so then I oh. reached out because I... I first thought, I was like, okay, uh, Alicia, me and Alicia have talked about canning beans. I reached out to Alicia. She was like, I don't know, but you know, Monica is the queen of leftovers and the electric pr pressure canner. If you don't know, uh, listeners, Monica is the queen of leftovers. She cooks like 400 pounds of ground beef and then she cans the taco <laughs> meat. It's brilliant. Nah? But I was just going to say and jump on the soapbox from Monica because we've said this season is unscripted, so we were. All, I know all y'all were wondering who was going to do it first, me or Alicia. It's it's Casey. Um, when Monica was saying that these tickets for hundreds and hundreds of dollars to go see the big YouTubers, not saying that these big YouTubers are not good. They are actually the same as you that just happened to fall on some luck and good YouTube algorithm. Because I know personally. YouTubers that have a substantial amount less followers but are more knowledgeable. I'm just going to call it out. Love Doug and Stacy, love Roots and Refuge, love Living Traditions Homestead, but there are many things that I've tried. If you followed us for a while on Ormsby Farm, you know we just got um, turkeys and chickens. We watched a video with Sarah and Kevin from Living Traditions Homestead and we as a family wrote down notes. Not one of those notes has paid off that they gave on their YouTube channel. It actually was better to call Monica and talk to her. FaceTime Lisa when I had pasty butt and have Lisa walk me through getting pasty butt gone so if you're listening casey's on the soapbox can i just say can i just say can i just say casey's chicken yes. had casey butt pasty butt casey did not have pasty butt no his chicken I, did i just I, want to make I, that clear yes i did not have pasty he does butt. live in no, georgia chickens. yes <laughs> and that's but we don't we don't visit walmart so that's where most of the pasty butters go is walmart so okay now okay now <laughs> I'm doing a lot of call out unscripted. <laughs> Lisa. Uh, so, yeah. So I am not one of these. Um, I know we're unscripted, but I still want to be appropriate. Um, I, I don't fangirl over YouTube channels. Um, I much prefer to build a relationship with the folks that I have. And just because Joe Schmo has a million and five followers doesn't mean that they know it all. Um, in fact, Joe Schmo with a million and one followers is now changed everything they're doing and is catering to the million and five followers so they can have two million and five. So I feel that the person that I've built my relationship with is who I care about. So I don't need to go to some event that considers themselves all of us in America when they only hold it on one side of the United States. Sorry, feeling a little scalded. Um, 
and they never Preach have it, it anywhere it. near me. Huh? Preach what it. He said, Preach he said, it. Preach it. You know, the yeah. thing is, is, is these, these big channels that get mm -hmm. a lot of views, they live in different zones. They have different things to deal with with their animals and their gardens and their living circumstances. And that's just one thing to consider. But it goes back to something that Lisa and I and, and our other co-hosts here have always said. We want what we do to be organic. We want the growth to be organic. We want the knowledge to be organic. We want the education to be organic. And we don't want it to rely and simply come down to crunching numbers. And this is where the community that Lisa and Monica and Casey are speaking about is so important because you may watch the larger channels and enjoy the larger channels. I'm going to admit that's where I got my start was watching some of these larger channels. And, and I have, I've not had any negative interaction. It's been positive. But at the end of the day, if I reach out to them and say, hey, it's Alicia, they're going to be like, who? Where when you have this other homesteading community or this farming community, I can reach out to any of my co-hosts here and, mm -hmm. and others in the social media connections and say, hey, this is Alicia and I need help. And they go, okay, hey, Alicia, I got your back. What can I do for you? It's that interpersonal relationship that will pay off as since we're talking about being frugal. That's where your time and effort and relationship uh, monies, so to speak, your, your relationship currencies, that's where those need to go. I agree. I agree. And that's the thing. I mean, the, the other thing is understand that you need to connect. And, and this, again, goes back to frugal, right? You want to connect with people who think the way you do. So in order for if I connected with a person who is pulling in a lot of money from their YouTube channel, which I am not, and that's fine, right? The reality of it is, is they have different resources than I have. I want to connect with like-minded people who have the same values that I have because the reality of it is my values guide my decisions. And so if I hook up with somebody who doesn't have the same values, for example, one of the challenges out here is everything is commercial ranching on a very large scale. So they don't understand why I'm bringing a pig in my house. They don't understand why I only have one pig in the middle of the winter or why I chose to farrow when I did. You know what I mean? So it's a little different. And so for me, it's all about values. And I don't need to pay to go to a convention, whereas I could spend $10 and go to AKKPS, which is the American Cooney Cooney Pig Society, and have an online class from folks who are registered Cooney Cooney breeders and can tell me an alternative to raising a piglet with scrotal hernia, right, which we can know can be a death sentence. And so I can learn how to have a roasted suckling pig and not lose that investment for my farm. Also not have the trauma of having that pig die prematurely and in an awful death, right? $10 from AKKPS, and they do it all the time. They talk about uh, IKHR does it, which is another one. So there's other resources out there. I don't need to go to Virginia every year to hobnob with people. I want to be with real people who are walking the walk every day, and I don't have the farm sitter which would cost me money, then with the travel expenses to go do that. So, I, Monica, you were going to say? Well, I think, too, I'm not, I'm not trying to put down all these conferences because there are a lot of smaller conferences that are like bigger get-togethers, bigger um, conferences that are they, they're group gatherings where you do have speakers that they're not charging hundreds and hundreds of dollars and you don't have to travel to one location. There's different ones. So one of the things we've been trying to do here, and we did it through YouTube originally, but we're not solely with YouTube, but it's with also, you know, you've got just homesteaders in general, is that we got together with a couple other people that we knew and said, hey, we want to do what's called a skill share. We just want to share what we have. We want to get together and we want to um, 
share what we have. Let's set up five or six people to come in, share a skill set that they're really knowledgeable in, something that they enjoy doing, something that they can share with us and teach us so that we can all come together. The first time we did it, we didn't charge any money, but there was a loss because we had to like rent a place and it was a lot on the person that really set this up. So the second time we did it at a church, the church wasn't really charging us anything. So what we were able to do was ask for donations to put back into the church, which is awesome because for us, it wasn't this big thing. It was a bunch of people getting together and learning very valuable skills. We processed turkeys right there in the middle of an auditorium. We um, talked about growing our own herbs and making fresh lemon basil tea. And each of these people came in with their resources, with their time, with their energy, and they gave the knowledge that they had and they shared. This was all because one person talked to another person talked to another person. And this is something that we're wanting to do and move everywhere. So these smaller conferences, these smaller get-togethers, just watch what you're investing your money into because ultimately these bigger, bigger conferences that are so far out there and they're also, they pull a lot of your time and energy, but they also pull so much of your resources when it comes to your actual money. Um, Just make sure you know what you're getting out of it because if that benefits you, awesome. But I think a lot of people get sucked into the whole, oh, I can go and I can meet these people that I've seen on YouTube or that I've heard on a podcast or that I've watched on, you know, Facebook or blogging or TikTok or whatever it is. That's super. But you could meet them in the grocery store too, because you know, they go there. And you know, they go to the Walmart and the Target probably. And you know, they go to these places and you could see them there just as much as you see them on at a homesteader conference. So just be mindful of how much you invest your energy and your brain power into spending that money to go and do those things. Look for things that are more local. And that's where I would say get together because you're going to make those local resources and it's going to be so different and it's going to make such a world of difference in your home setting. So that's kind of what I want to say. They were all bad. They're not all bad. And I'm not trying to pick on anybody. But just, yeah, be frugal and watch your money on that. I agree. It's it's not all bad. It's just, for me, it's, I want to focus on what's real and what we're doing. I'm not focused on rubbing elbows. I would much rather call my boo thing and say, let's talk about pasty butt versus, but that's a real conversation. You know what I mean? To me, that is the most beneficial thing that I could do is to help a friend who's struggling with something that I knew how to fix, you know? Um, so it was a great conversation with you guys today. Just flows so amazing. I love it. So, so guys, I have got an announcement. I want to throw this out there. Um, you know, the farm is getting busier and busier here. And we have, you know, part of my retirement was, early retirement was to focus on life and focus on the farm. And so at this point, I'm kind of feeling like I'm, getting pulled in 50 directions and I hate it because it's a hard decision but I am choosing not to come back for the rest of this season Um, no anything against my co-host because I love them all dearly they are all dear friends and we all still talk all the time and text and we will continue to I just have decided that it was pulling me away from some of the purposes that I wanted for my life And what I mean by that is when my mom died of Alzheimer's, I decided I wanted to have less pressure in my life and I just wanted to live in the moment. And so a part of my living in the moment means not having a schedule, not having, um, I'm doing what I want to do when I want to do it. And because of that, I've lost some weight. Um, My blood pressure is down, my cholesterol is down. So something is going right here. And really, that's just what Ryan and I are focusing on is living life and enjoying our farm. Not a lot of big travels at all. And that's okay. But just we're looking to simplify and quiet life and just enjoy time on the farm. So you guys are going to be missed and you're going to make me cry. But I'm going to miss you guys. But I know we're going to talk every day and I love you guys. We appreciate enjoy being a part of this. So thank you. We appreciate you coming on today and making sure that we start our season off right with some good conversation about all the farming stuff. And we just love that you're here and being able to just share. Yeah, I I think it's important. And and all of us are a little emotional right now because, you know, (laughs) it won't be the same, but that's okay. 
Because here Lisa is proving everything we've just been talking about. And she's being frugal with something that is a top priority to her. And that's her time and her focus and her energy. And all of us support her in that wholeheartedly 100%. And so you have to realize that as you're working on your homestead or working on your farm or working on your little family, sometimes you have to shift things up to make them work for you. So we applaud Lisa in making these decisions for herself. We fully support her. We yes, will we miss do. her. But we also know that when we need her, she's there for us. And the door is always open for her to be a guest host anytime she wants. She's always part of our hay bale. I, I agree. I mean, I, I would love to be a guest host anytime. I just found that I was committing to things that were taking me farther away from um, the peace that I was looking for, the just, you know, the day-to-day -day, um, enjoyment and stuff like that. So it's just been a really good time, and I appreciate it. And if you need a guest, holler at me, and I'll be here. You know we will. And we love, love you. you guys. We love you. So, you know, with that, on that note of celebration for Lisa, branching out in different directions and different avenues and reaching for her goals and her dreams. We're going to go ahead and we're going to close up this episode. We thank you so much for joining us. And make sure you come back for the next episode and episodes beyond. We really love having you join us around the hay bale.